All right, greetings, everybody. Greetings, everyone. I have the, this is Evan Solbert. I'll be the host of uh, this webinar. Uh, we're very uh, fortunate today to have Rabbi Yaakov Feldman. Uh, a few housekeeping tips for you. At the bottom of your screen, your viewer, you should see a little icon that says Q and A. So if you have questions and you'd like to uh, pose those to the rabbi, please click on those and put those in. And he'll type, you'll type those in, he'll see those, and he'll respond as needed. Uh, this meeting, as uh, Jeff noted, is being recorded. Be a record of it, and you can watch it again, or you can tell your friends and have them view it as well. It will also be on the uh, Booster Institute YouTube channel as well. Uh, the webinar should last approximately an hour. Uh, the rabbi usually uh, asks, takes questions and answers at the end as well, so you don't have to feel that uh, if you don't get it in now, you'll never see it. Uh, the, uh, this is Rabbi Yaakov Feldman, who has translated and commented upon four classical works of Musar. Rabbi Moshe Haim Luzado is The Path of the Just. Bachi Ibn Pekuda's Duties of the Heart, Rabbi Yonah's The Gates of Repentance, and Rabbi Moses Maimonides, Eight Chapters. He has authored several other works awaiting publication, and he also offers email classes under the auspices of the well-known Jewish website Torah.org, entitled Spiritual Excellence and Ramhal. He and his family live near Monsey, New York. Rabbi Feldman also serves as a rabbi chaplain at Good Samaritan Hospital in Suffern, New York. Rabbi, it's all yours. Thank you, Evan. Greetings, everybody. Shalom Aleichem. We're now to chapter four, pick a, a vote. We're going to touch upon the first Mishnah. Uh, it's good to see old faces again and uh, new faces. That's a pleasure as well. We're just coming after Passover, so we might reference back to that. Um, if we can have screen one, Evan, please. I right, here is our mission, okay? We're gonna just zip through it now, and then we're gonna get down it point by point, okay? Ben Zoma would say, who is wise, one who learns from every man, as it's stated in Psalms 119.99, from all my teachers I have grown wise, who is strong, one who overpowers his inclinations, as it's stated in Proverbs 16.32, better one who is slow to anger than one who with might, one who rules his spirit, than the captor of a city, who is rich, one who is satisfied with his lot, as it's stated in Psalms 128.2, if you eat of the work of your hands, you are praiseworthy and it is good for you. You are praiseworthy in this world and it is good for you in the world to come. And who is honorable? Uh, one who honors his fellows, as it's stated in 1 Samuel 2.30, for those who honor me, I will honor, I don't think we have the bottom of that, uh, me, I will honor, those who despise me will be disgraced. Okay, let's take away screen one, please, Evan. Thank you so much. Okay, now these are words of wisdom. Uh, we're going to touch upon each one of them separately in the process of time. We're going to go rather slowly today. We have uh, about 50 minutes. I'm going to leave uh, five or 10 minutes at the end for questions. If something is inherently problematic to you on the spot, and it's because I've raised the point, you wonder about it or you object to it, you can uh, make a point at that time. Okay? All right. So these four things, okay? Uh, rabbi Yitzchak Chaver, who was a 19th century rabbi, uh, points out that these are simply the major factors of life, which are to say uh, wisdom, strength, wealth, and honor. When he means what he means to say, wisdom stands for knowledge. I mean, these, it's an important factor in life it, it, as to how much knowledge you have. Strength stands for power or influence and in health. You know, how much power does one have? How much influence does one have? Degree of one's health. Wealth stands for economic well-being, of course, and honor stands for social standing or one's self-worth. So these are the basic pillars of the everyday experience, and we want to know what really counts and what really doesn't count. So, so it can be taken in that term. Um, we'll return to these, though, each at a separate point. Uh, but, and we'll want to know, who, who was this Ben Zoma 
who raised this point by the name is not his name was not Ben as in Benjamin Zelma. Ben Zelma is is a surname, and uh, his actual name was uh, give me a second Isaac I believe no Shimon Shimon Ben Zelma. Okay, so Ben Zumba was an actual person. He had a history. He had a philosophy in life. And that will affect our understanding of what he had to say. All right, let's go to screen two. We can see something very interesting. All right, here we go from Lao Tzu. Okay. Lao Tzu was, Lao Tzu was a Chinese philosopher. He uh, the start the uh, progenitor of, uh, uh, of uh, Taoism. Okay, listen to this: knowing others is intelligence. Knowing yourself is true wisdom. Mastering others is strength. Mastering yourself is true power. When you are content to be simply yourself and don't compare or compete, everyone will respect you. So we have three of the four themes we're talking about today, you know. We're talking about wisdom here and wealth and honor, etc. Okay? So obviously, these are themes that bothered the ancients. The ancient want, ancients wondered, what is true wisdom? What is true wealth? or strength rather, what is true wealth, what is true honor, okay? Now, we in modernity don't know a thing about wisdom. We, we don't concern ourselves with wisdom. Um, we don't talk about sages. We don't talk about, what we talk about is the accumulation of knowledge, the accumulation of data and facts, the wherewithal and the wits to put them together, okay? So we talk about sharpness of mind. We talk about depth of knowledge. We talk about width of knowledge, but we don't talk about wisdom, okay? So the ancients, if you please take down screen too, thanks a lot. So the ancients were concerned about that. So what is true wisdom, okay? Um, all right, give me a second here. All right, so the question could be raised. Lao Tzu, we're not going to argue about what he had to say and not compare it and contrast it with uh, Ben Zelma. But we, we're touched by the fact that he had an opinion and others had opinions about that too. But the question is, how did Lao Tzu arrive at his opinions, okay? As opposed to Ben Zoma, how did he know? You notice the difference. Let's go back to screen one, please. Evan, if you can. Here we go. You notice Ben Zoma brings citations for his opinions. He doesn't just say who is wise once he learns from every man, period. He cites from Psalms. The second paragraph, he doesn't just say who is strong one who overpowers his inclinations. That's his opinion. He cites from Proverbs. Okay? And who is rich? He doesn't just come up with one who is satisfied with his lot. He brings down, he cites Psalms. And the fourth paragraph, who is honorable, one who honors his fellows, and he cites the book of Samuel. Okay. Let's go back to screen two. You'll notice then Lao Tzu cites no one. Okay. Knowing others is intelligence, he declares. Knowing yourself is true wisdom, he declares. Mastering others is strength. Mastering yourself is true power. When you are content to be simply yourself and don't compare or compete, everyone will respect you, he declares. He opines. Okay? I mean, where does he know that? I mean, the assumption is that Lao Tzu was wise. Okay? What that means is those who are Taoists have faith in the wisdom and the wherewithal of Lao Tzu, okay? Let's go back to screen one. 
Evan, if I make you a little dizzy today, forgive me, okay? We're back to screen one now. We're going to Benzelma. Now, all we know is that Benzelma came up with these great insights into the books of Psalms, Proverbs, and the book of Samuel, okay? These insights were not necessarily wise. They were sharp and they were clear, okay? All right. So if I were a Taoist, I would claim that Lao Tzu was privy to information from the heavens, okay? That Lao Tzu, deep in his meditations, as he roamed the mountains of China somewhere, as he per perhaps dealt with sheep, okay, perhaps crossed the rivers in China somewhere, arrived at these revelations, that one who is wise is so-and-so, one who is to be respected is so-and-so, okay. But Benzoma derived his insights, not from his what, back and forth roamings, the hills of Judea, perhaps, but rather sitting in the yeshiva, okay? And Zama was a scholar. So the natural inclination in modernity is to trust Ben Zoma less than Lao Tzu, because Lao Tzu arrived at these from his heart, okay? Now this is a tough question, okay? So this is an issue, please take down screen two, uh, one again. Let's just go without his screen. Thank you, Evan. Okay. So all right, we have two different insights now. We have intuition versus knowledge, okay? Versus revelation versus prophecy, okay? We have intuition versus prophecy and revelation. All right, so let's see who Ben Zoma was. Ben Zoma was a human being, okay? He, again, his first name is Shimon Ben Zoma. Shimon Ben Zoma was his whole name. He's referred to as Ben Zoma. His last name is if I were to be called Feldman instead of Shimon Ben Zoma, instead of my being called Yanko Feldman. Because Ben Zoma, unfortunately, died as a young man. He wasn't, he didn't uh, receive ordination, smicha. And so he's, uh, he's not referred to as a title as Rabbi Shimon Ben Zoma because he didn't. He was too young to, he died too young to have earned smicha, earned ordination. He thrived around the first third of the second century of the common era, around 225, 230. That's when his epic point was. Uh, he died young, as he says, he's one of the four who entered into the garden of esoteric knowledge, the Pardes. Now here's something. This is not just a teacher. He was a capitalist, okay? He was an explorer, okay? So we're taught that there were four who entered into the Garden of Esoteric Knowledge, okay? It's called the Pardes. He was one of them, which speaks volumes about the man's personhood, okay? He wasn't just a scholar. He was an explorer. He was a teacher. He was a capitalist. He was a seeker. He was much a seeker, perhaps, as Lao Tzu. I would, do, I would dare say more of a seeker than Lao Tzu, okay? Or than others of that ilk, okay? Now, there are two kinds of people in this world, two, time, two kinds of teachers. There are academics, and then there, there are those who come from personal experience, okay? Now, if I were to teach cooking, you would want me to be speaking from personal experience. You wouldn't want me to just talk about the fact that I had ingested, if you pardon the pun, the book of James Beard, right? You wouldn't just want me to have just come up with facts that I would have explored online and never having touched a dish in my life. You would want me to be have want me to have mastered the functions of cooking and pre preparing food. So here we have Ben Zelma, who had been there, okay. He had been an explorer. He entered into the garden of secret knowledge. But he didn't succeed at that. 
Okay, it's very interesting. He beheld the secrets of the garden. We're taught in the, in the uh, Talmud, in Hachagiga, page 14b, but he went mad. The secrets were too much to him. They overwhelmed his being. So that's fascinating. He strove and he didn't succeed. He was overwhelmed. He took things to heart and they simply burst his being. Here's a, a, a famous quote of Ben Zoma, which speak to the, the width of the man's heart, okay? This is a quote from the Tosefta in Brachos page uh, 7 or 6b. Ben Zoma seeing the crowds on the Temple Mount, said, Blessed be he who created all of these to attend to my needs. Yeah. How much had Adam to weary himself with? All right, so when Adam and Eve were around, they had a lot to do to take care of things, right? Not a mouthful could be he taste before he plowed and sowed and cut and bound sheaves and threshed and winnowed and sifted the grain and ground and sifted the flour and kneaded and baked and then he ate. But I get up in the morning and find all this ready before me. How much had Adam to worry himself with? Not a shirt could he put on before he sheared and washed the wool and hatched it and dyed and spun and wove and sewed and then he clothed himself but i rise in the morning and find all this ready before me how many trades are anxiously busy early in the morning and i rise and find all these things before me listen to the wisdom and vision of the man adam and eve were the greatest people arguably ever to have lived I grant you they blew it, okay? They were not the people they had been at the end that they had been at the beginning, but they started from a lofty site. But Benzelma realized that they had to struggle every single day. Imagine being the first two people in the world, okay? You couldn't stop off at a 7-Eleven for coffee. You had to make coffee. You had to invent coffee, okay? You had to invent the way, then you had to grow the beans, and you had to process the beans, and then you had to make them into coffee, and then you had to learn how to milk cows, and you had to learn how to deal with sugar, etc., etc. But Zoma says, God has been so good to me. All this before me. All the more so to us, of course, all, we've all been handed the world on a silver platter, okay? But here's the character of the man, Ben Zoma. Not only was he, was he an esoteric, not only was he a capitalist, not only was he an explorer, but he was a deep, wide, and, and remarkable receptor of reality, okay? So here's the man that was Ben Zoma, okay? So he came up with these four maxims. In his discovery of the world, in his realization that everything was presented before him on a silver platter, in his understanding that God is good to each one of us, okay? I see in my capacity as a chaplain, I see people all the time in dire straits, but they realize how much they have going for them despite that if they're smart and they realize that so much is being done for them despite their illness if they're smart so let's go back to to um, screen one if we could there evan please okay Let's go into our Mishnah per se and discover what it has to say to, to some more degree. Give me a moment here. All right, so Ben Zama would say, who is actually what? Let's go to about, let's can reconsider like Laoza and the other ancients. And they wonder, okay? So we said that uh, uh, Rabbi Yitzchak Chavar said this is part of life. Knowledge stands for, uh, wisdom stands for knowledge and insight, etc., etc. But the ancients really wondered, what is wisdom, okay? Who's truly wise in this world? Again, we don't dwell on that in, in modernity, okay? 
So we don't even realize that there is wisdom. We don't even realize that there is wisdom. But if he's asking, and the ancients ask with him, who is wise? In other words, who's really wise? So he says, one who learns from everyone. As it's stated in Psalms, from all my teachers, I have grown wise. In other words, from everybody whom I made my teachers, I have grown wise. Now, this is a remarkably wise statement itself, or a foolish statement. If I learn from everybody, most people don't know very much. It's just a given. Most people don't know very much. Most people aren't privy to the information we need to get by. Most people are not privy to the information we they or, or I need to be successful. Okay? So if I learn from everybody, I might be a fool. I'm going to waste my time. Shouldn't I be learning from the wise themselves and exclusively? Shouldn't I be learning from one or two masters in life? Shouldn't I have my Rebbe? Shouldn't I have my master from whom I receive wisdom? Shouldn't I have a particular soul who has a particular insight into reality and depend upon his or her own insights? But Ben Zelma says, no. Who is wise? One who learns from every man. Look about, go back to that quote that Ben Zelma, that insight, that wide and and deep insight he had on top of the, the Temple Mount, seeing all the hundreds of thousands of people going by. So he saw everyone, saw back to history to Adam and Eve, and saw everyone there, the hundreds of thousands of people on the Temple Mount. And he who saw the crowds, the most democratic of souls, perhaps said, one who is wise is one who learns from everyone. Okay, we could learn from everyone. We can learn from everyone's mistakes, for example. If I see someone's a fool, okay, he or she suffers by his or her missteps, I learn from that. If I see someone who's successful and I learn from his or her steps, I learn from that. But there's something else to be said about this. One who learns from everyone. If one goes into one's own heart, okay, if one meditates, one dwells upon one's being, one goes down deep, one sees everyone, okay? There are a number of stages to go down deep in reflection and meditation. When, clo when one closes one's eyes, one closes off the world, and one shuts one's self down. One then goes down to a deeper view of one's self after having shut one's self down. Then one goes deeper, deeper into nothingness, where one no longer exists, and then one goes deeper yet to where one really exists, and one catches sight of something, that everyone in the world can be found in my heart, okay? Every genius, every fool, every robber and criminal and every saint, tzaddik, and every mundane individual, and every mundane thought, and every mundane wish and desire can be found in my heart and in your heart. For each one of us is everyone, okay? So if I learn from the everyone that is in my soul, and I catch sight of the murderer in my personality, the thief in my personality, the selfless, pious one in my personality, the charitable, giving one in my personality, okay, etc., etc. If I cast sight of everyone in my everyone, 
and I see that I am everyone, I contain everyone, that is wisdom, okay? True wisdom is recognizing that learning from the everyone that is in me. And by the way, this is a good case for the study of literature. Let that be said. But one studies good literature, one is exposed to more and more souls and the workings of more and more hearts. But we'll just close that parenthesis there. There's a lot to be said about that. So Ben Zoma says, who is wise? One who learns from every man, as is stated from all my teachers, that is, from all whom I made teachers, I have grown wise. Second paragraph, who is strong? All right, so what is strength? So, so we think of strength today. We're very impressed with strength, okay? We're martial strength, right? Military strength, business strength, fiducial strength, power, acquisition. So who is strong? What is strength? The one who is strong is one who overpowers his inclinations. Okay? As it said, better one who is slow to anger than one with might, one who rules his spirit than the captor of a city. In other words, if you can actually be slow to anger and you can rule over your spirit, you're strong. And this is tough stuff. He's absolutely right about this, okay? If you incline towards anger and somehow slowly, 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 you get to the point where you no longer become angry as quickly. And then once again, slowly, 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 you get to the point where you hardly ever get angry. And then slowly and slower yet you get to the point where you don't ever get angry that's strong that's mighty you're just because whereas at first you were roiling in your being okay with anger perhaps whereas at first it just overtook you if you've ever suffered from anger or suffered from this that which overtakes you and you tap that down in the process of time and you learn to control that in the process of time and you as the quote say says you rule your spirit you overcome you right that's strong so there's there's the, oh, there's the you that overlooks things that oversees things right observes things from the outside, and there's the you inside that acts and reacts, okay? So that roiling being in the inside should be overcome by the you on the outside. Huge Freudian terminology, the id versus the superego. So that roiling id on the inside should be controlled by the superego on the outside. But it's often, often not, okay? It's like the spoiled brat on the, in the inside, right? Gets away with murder to the parent on the outside, right? But if the parent somehow, the superego somehow learns to tamper down the spoiled, the inner spoiled brat, that's strength. That's power. It's tough. All right, so you might think Herculean strength is strength. Yeah, that's great. I'm not impressed, okay? So if you work out eight hours a day, right, for 10 years, five, six days a week, and you do that, yeah, you've accomplished something, but I'm not really impressed. Your biceps have grown. The muscles will do what muscles will do when taken to that extreme, because that's what muscles do. But to control the roiling inner spoiled brat, yeah, it goes against the muscles. It goes against nature. 
Whereas muscles will grow as muscles will grow, which is part of the natural course of things. Spoiled brats will not be under control, taken under control. It's not according to the nature of things. Spoiled brats will overtake everything by the course of the nature of things. So who is strong one who overpowers his inclinations as stated in Proverbs 16.32, better one who is slow to anger than one with might, one who rules his spirit and the captor of a city. Okay, who is rich? All right, so we have a very wealthy president these days. Wealth is in the news. He never is only worth three or four billion dollars uh, Bloomberg, I believe, is worth 73 or 75 billions of dollars. I can't even fathom that. And um, uh, uh, who's the gentleman from um, Microsoft? His name escapes me now. Is worth 100 or uh, so billions of dollars. Okay. So the world knows about wealth today. It's right up there. It's in, in the news all the time. But really, so the ancients wondered, hmm, what's really wealth? All right, so you have somebody in antiquity who has a thousand sheep, a thousand sheep, 250 mules, right? More than the eye can see. He was considered a shah, a prince. Okay, he held great wealth, a very wealthy man. More sheep than you can see at one fell swoop, okay? More than you can ever count at one at one instance, in one instance. He was considered to be wealthy, okay? He was his he was the billionaire of his day. But that's just out there. I mean, you can only eat one thing at a time, okay? You can only sleep on one bed at a time. And you can only live in one house at a time. Okay? So Ben Zoma asked, all right, so really, what's wealth? Who's really wealthy? And he says, one who is satisfied with his lot. In other words, if you're happy with what you got, you're a wealthy man, as stated in Psalms 128 too. If you eat the work of your hands, you are praiseworthy and it is good for you, okay? In other words, it's good for you. You're praiseworthy in this world. It's good for you in the world to come. This gloss here, where it explains the terms you are praiseworthy from Psalms, and it is good for you in Psalms. This gloss, where you are praiseworthy, stands for in this world. It's good for you in the world to come is a latter gloss upon the mission i perceive okay it didn't really come there it's tangential to the point at hand it does clear up the matter but that's an academic su uh, subject beyond our discourse today but he wants to say who is really rich one who's satisfied with his lot okay so if you're sitting there okay like ben zelma on top of the temple mount you're looking at across the hundreds of thousands of people, and you realize how much you have, okay? Because unlike Adam and Eve, who were the, the, the most brilliant, the wisest of people, they had to make their cup of coffee, literally make a cup of coffee, right? Literally make it. They had to make the coffee, make the sugar, get the milk, make the cup, etc. But I'm a wealthy guy. I'm very satisfied. Yeah, I have to do this and I have to do that, but look how much I don't have to do. <clears throat> so if you're, if you're satisfied with your lot, if like me, you don't have a heck of a lot in this world, but somehow you sense your personal wealth because you, have, you do have so much, Every day you're, you're healthy is a blessing from God. Every day you're with family and or friends is a blessing from God. If you have a really good spoon, you like, you know, it does good things, right? If you're a cook, let's go back to that metaphor, and you have a particular pan, <coughs> your favorite pan, which is like, it's like you love this pan, yeah. You're a wealthy individual, 
Okay. You might need you might need a hundred pens in the process of your of your career, but you have this particular pen you're just crazy about. Yeah. And you're satisfied with this pen, with your lot in life. You're a happy, you're a wealthy individual. And we go down to the fourth point. Who is honorable? Who is really to be respected? Okay. Is it the wealthy person? Is it the wise person? Is it the strong person? Ben Zelma says, one who is honorable is one who honors his fellows. Other people, he honors other people, as it's stated in one, the book, first book of Samuel. For those who honor me, I will honor. Those who despise me will be disgraced. Okay? This is referring to God. If you honor God and you honor um, uh, then you will be honored yourself. So one who honors his fellows. It's a quite point. He's equating other human beings with God. So honoring other human beings is honoring God. But the, the overarching point is one who is honorable is not just for what he himself has accomplished in this world, but rather what he does in his relation to others. All right. But wait a minute. We have a strange, strange quote, okay? Let's go to screen three, Evan, please. Look at this quote from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 9, verses 22, 23. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast of his wisdom, right? Wise man, or the strong man. Boast of his strength. There's our strength, yeah. Nor the rich man. Boast of his riches. There's our rich man. But let him that boasts exult in this, that he understands and knows me. Boom. Everything's just undone. Everything we've just acquired is undone, Jeremiah says. Forget about this junk. Forget about that. It's all worldly. It's all super worldly, okay? So what is that? None of this, according to Jeremiah, really matters. Let's take down that screen if we can, Evan. None of this really matters. Thanks, Evan. None of this really matters. What matters is your relationship to God Almighty. Okay? So this goes back to Benzoma as the seeker. Benzoma wanted to enter into the garden of esoteric knowledge. Which is to say, to have a relationship with God. Okay? Now, just as we don't talk about wisdom today, it's just not in our vocabulary. The idea of a sustainable, intimate relationship with God Almighty is out of our vocabulary today, too. <clears throat> God Almighty is tangible in your heart, so to speak. If you close your eyes, perhaps early morning or late at night, and under your breath or inside your heart, you talk to God. You just acknowledge his presence at the time. You acknowledge his presence in your life. You acknowledge that were it not for his abilities to give you ability, you would have no ability. If you just acknowledge the fact that God is the capacity behind all capacities, that God's will wills reality, okay? God did not have to create the universe. Okay, we're taught by the Moshe Hamlet Sato. God didn't have to create the universe, which is to say reality. God did not have to create any reality whatsoever. Everything could have just been God's and had as it had been from the first. Everything could have just been God as it had been from the first. But God, for some reason, decided to create reality. So forget about wisdom on my part or your part. Forget about wealth on my part or your part. Forget about honor, yeah. Forget about power. 
we have to relate, we have to arrive at some kind of sustainable, intimate relationship with God if we're ever to be anything whatsoever. Jeremiah points out. Now, Jeremiah witnessed the destruction of the first temple. Okay. Jeremiah was a sage and a prophet. And he said, what matters most for us all is that we have a sustainable, intimate relationship with God. Forget about wisdom, forget about power, forget about this, forget about that. What matters is the relationship with God. So there's two things out of our vocabulary today. Off the radar today. Totally is number one, wisdom. Number two, a relationship with God. Praying to God is one thing we as Jews pray to God three times a day and at length. Prayer is important. Prayer accomplishes. But at bottom, what prayer is meant to do is to remind us of the existence of God. Okay? The course of a busy day, it takes time to pray. <clears throat> so um, when I get up earlier, perhaps, to go to services, I'm reminded of God. When I go to services in the middle of the afternoon or late afternoon, it's frankly sometime an imposition on my time. But it reminds me of the existence of God. And late at night, or not quite that late at night, when I pray the, pray the evening service, it reminds me of God. And when I want to sit back and have a drink, perhaps, and gloat over the accomplishments of the day, to prove how wise I've been, how strong I've been, etc., etc. But instead, I remember God. That's important, but that's off our radar. Okay? So as uh, Yitzchak Haver points out at the beginning, these are the make these are the exigencies of the modern life, okay? Wisdom, which is to say knowledge, wealth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But really true wisdom. We need to explore that. Not just to speak to everyone, okay, to get wisdom from everyone. That's the main thing, according to Ben Zelma. But to just acquire wisdom. So what is wisdom again? Okay, let's go back to that point. So wisdom isn't just the acquisition of data. It's not just the ability to recall. It's not just the experience one has, perhaps at, at the course of a, of a long and fulfilled life. Because one can be a fool and be an old person. One could be a fool and to have a, chalked up this and that in one's experience. But wisdom comes from a depth of being, comes from a depth, depth of longing to know. It comes from the ability to laugh at what doesn't matter, okay? It comes from the ability to know what does matter. That's what we should acquire for. That's what we should try to acquire. That's what we should seek after. Okay? And what brings wisdom is the general knowledge of the existence of God Almighty. For Shalom, God Almighty exists in comparison. We really don't. God is such a brilliant light in his being. And then in comparison, we're overwhelmed by the light. We don't exist. As the expression goes in the, in the Talmud, how does lighting a match in the full face of the sun count for anything at all? Okay. The lit match in front of the full face of the sun is, for all intents and purposes, is nil and, and null and void. So that's what we are, so to speak, in the full presence of the God of God Almighty. So forget about knowledge, forget about wealth, forget about acquisition, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
What matters is that you have a and a relationship to God Almighty. But wait a minute. Let's go to screen four. There's more to touch on. Thank you, Evan. Prophecy only manifests itself in a wise, strong, and wealthy individual. It was said in the, in the, in the Talmud and Shabbat, page 92a, prophecy only manifests itself in, again, touch upon wisdom, strength, and wealth. Okay? Wait a minute. So now the whole subject of the hand that Zoom is talking about is prophecy. Okay? All right, so here we go back to Benzoma versus Lao Tzu. Okay? Evan, forgive me. If we can go to screen two again. Okay. Lao Tzu, nice guy. Okay, good dancer. Right? A thinker. But he wasn't a prophet. He was an intuitive. He might have come on to real things. Again, let's go into what he has to say. Knowing others is intelligence. Knowing yourself is true wisdom. I agree with that. Knowing yourself is true wisdom. It's part of true wisdom. Master, mastering others is strength. Mastering yourself is true power. We talked about that. He's just he's on par with what Ben Zoma says, but he just came up with that. He intuited that from personal experience. When you are content to be simply yourself and don't compare uh, or compete, everyone will respect you. I don't have a problem with that. But how does he know? Okay. Had we the time, I'd give you counter instances to what he had to say. Had we the time, I'd give you quotes from others of that ilk, of other seekers, right? Other masters, religious, philosophical, mystical masters, I would cite, who would argue with this and the other thing. But how did they know? How did they know? They weren't prophets. Let's go back again, Evan, one last time to screen one. But Benzelma knew because he found sources for them, okay? Benzelma said, who is wise? The book of Psalms teaches us that. Who is strong? The book of Proverbs teaches us that. Who is rich? The book of Psalms teaches us that. And who is really to be honored? We learned that from the book of Samuel. Okay? So Benzoma learned his wisdom, derived his wisdom from his understanding of what prophets had to say. Okay, prophets, the prophets, the author of the book of Psalms, which is King David, the book of Proverbs, who is King Solomon, and the book of Samuel, who is Samuel himself, they were prophets. They had Ruach HaKodesh, holy insight and inspiration. They conversed with God. Okay. All right. So we don't have the time, but the Rambam goes into all kinds of steps about how one becomes a prophet. In short, one goes into a meditative stance. One quiet, quiets one's mind. One's mind. The ancient prophets used to listen to music to get themselves in a mood, and they would leave their minds open. But it wasn't their imagination that derived at things, but rather a higher form that allowed for shefa, a, a downflow from heaven to come upon them. So they were in direct communication with God, okay? Unlike Moses who spoke to God face to face, it was the highest degree of prophecy. Moses was always on, okay? Moses, Moses was always in a, a prophetic mode. Moses was able to say, oh God, by the way, what do you mean by, okay? And the other prophets were able to, to go into a meditative pose to ask a question and to wait for an answer and sometimes not to be answered. But the point of the matter is, please take our screen down, Evan. Thank you. The point of the matter is that having listened to the prophets, 
and having the capacity and the wide heart that he had, Benzoma found sources in Ruach HaKodesh and prophecy and divine inspiration, found sources to define who was wise, who was strong, etc., etc., etc. The bottom line lesson for us is the takeaways for us is it behooves us to discover what wisdom is in ourselves and in others and to find a wise teacher and follow him or her. It behooves us to develop relationships with God Almighty, because that's what we're striving for in this life. <clears throat> this isn't taught enough in synagogues. This isn't mentioned enough by our teachers. This isn't cited enough in articles, okay? But that's bottom line, it. The truth of the matter is we're here to develop a relationship with the revelation of God Almighty. Everything else is commentary, okay? Everything else is meant to feed into this one's relationship with God. I advise you, if you would, to take time in the course of your morning, afternoon, and night to think about God. Okay? To dwell upon the fact that God's in charge, not we. Okay? It's God who came up with the idea of reality. <clears throat> it's God who came up with the idea of allowing reality to exist. It's God who sustains reality. It's God's will that maintains reality and keeps it going. And the other lesson, the other takeaway is to respect the words of the prophets. Okay? The Torah wasn't just intuited. Okay? It wasn't just a couple of guys sitting in a room haggling back and forth. Should we do this? Should we do that? No. Torah was not written by committee. Right? The Torah was not made to be politically correct or whatever correct. The Torah is an insight, is an outcome of the communication with the Rabbi Shalom and God Almighty. My wish to you is that we all experience wisdom in our lives. We be exposed to wisdom in our lives. We develop that relationship to God and that we take it with us as we go through life. And we ourselves become wise, become strong. And we become wealthy and we become honorable so that we are the ones who are truly wise, wealthy, etc., etc. I thank you for listening to me. I'll take questions now. We have a few moments. Are there any? Thank you, Rabbi. This is Evan. So it's a wonderful presentation. Those of you who have questions, please feel free to ask those either through the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen or if you're in the chat. I can take a look at those and convey those as well. Everyone deep in contemplation here, Rabbi. I understand. It's lunchtime. <laughs> well. Simple question like, how have you the nerve to mention these things, Rabbi Feldman? I can handle it. Okay. Good point. It's a very good point. Okay. Uh, Pirkei Avot is uh, loaded with wisdom. Margo, okay, and him, Henri. Thanks, this all. I see there's a question coming up on the bottom here. Does someone pose a question? I'm going to go to my screen now. Thank you very much. Ravakasha to that Tedarabha. Was there a discourse between Benzoma and an alternative source? Um, I don't quite understand the question, Bill. Between Benzoma and what alternative source? In other words, does anyone argue with Benzoma about his points? among his contemporaries. I would imagine so. It's not cited, but I would imagine so. As the course of Jewish study, one uh, one hones one's mind by 
uh, arguing with someone else and one uh, one um, thins down one's possibilities to a deeper source of truth. Any other questions? Okay, I guess that does it for today. It's Actually, good. Rabbi, there are, uh, looks like in the Q&A, uh, there's a question from Greg. He asked, was Ben Zoma a prophet? No, he was not a prophet. He was a Talmudist. He was a master, right? He was a rabbi. Yes, he was not a prophet. I assure you, he, like, a, like all rabbis, myself included, he was not for profit, okay? So uh, he wasn't a prophet. Joanne Lanson asked, if God was there from the first, was there a first? Good question. Not until God created the first. Uh, time was created, right? Just as space was. So there was no beginning. Because to imply there was a beginning, there had to have been a first as opposed to a second. Okay? This touches upon all kinds of stuff. We can have one of those conversations about this. <laughs> Carolyn Isaacs asks, uh, do you have any suggestions for someone who is trying to develop a regular three times per day uh, dominant practice in breaking through the resistance to stopping midday for Minka? I mean, that's, oh, it's everybody's struggle. And that's a holy struggle. Okay. If it was real easy to pull that one off, ha, what's the credit to be derived from that? Mm -hmm. But we all struggle with that, right? To take 10 minutes off the course of a busy day, to move away from this world into the other world. Laudable. It, it's, it's the muscle the muscle that one builds doing that. Is that what makes one's arms mighty, okay? Marie asks, any further suggestions on deepening intimacy with Hashem? And how does this relate to how we engage with others? Okay. Yeah. One has to know that there's a God in the world. To do that, one talks to God. Forget about formal prayer. That's a side, a side to point. One talks to God. I talk to God all the time. I learned that from my mother. May she rest in peace. I address God hundreds of times a day. I talk to God. I confide in God. I sigh to God, okay? How that helps me with my relationship with other people. If I can open my heart to God Almighty and be honest, then I can open my heart to others I love and be honest to them too. If I'm willing to seek counsel with God, rather than just doing and saying, God will help, yeah, and I can do that with other people too and seek help from other people as well. It's a good question. Thank you, Rabbi. I think uh, we're at our time. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Uh, thank you, uh, Rabbi Feldman. Wonderful, as always. I don't think I'll have too many nightmares about jumping from slides for a while, but uh, I, <laughs> I appreciate your time. Everyone, again, this is a, has been recorded. It will be available for your review. It is also going to be on the YouTube, uh, the Musser Institute YouTube channel as well. So with that, I think we'll end this webinar. Thanks so much, Rabbi. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you, Jeff.